Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, psychological factors in neuromuscular conditions with a focus on the Carlos disease and uh, glycogen, glycogen storage diseases. I'm going to cover three main areas uh, looking at the psychological impact of illness, particularly the stress of being uh, ways of coping and patterns, uh, Macarthur specific issues, and then uh, at the end, a section on uh, demystifying psychology and what happens in the psychology room. So, what is the stress of illness? Well, uh, illness actually is a, a stressful event, unsurprisingly, uh, but there's particular aspects of it that make it more or less stressful. Uh, so, conditions that are novel, unpredictable, and where there's a perceived lack of control, or indeed there is no control, uh, are deemed or perceived as being more stressful, uh, and where there's loss or change. Now, if the ability to cope is felt to be limited or poor, uh, this can also increase the level of uh, stress or the perception of the event as being threatening. And this uh, inability to cope uh, can be slightly more uh, subtle, so it's not necessarily the ability to cope with the illness itself, i.e. The, the, the pathology, if you like, uh, or the condition, but also maybe the inability to cope with what the consequences are. So, for example, not being able to do something or a change in one's role may be felt to be uh, more than one can cope with. So uh, it may not be the obvious uh, aspect. Um, now, sometimes when people are diagnosed or experiencing health difficulties, the anxiety and depression that arises from this can itself become problematic. And by that, what I mean is um, it may actually impede any other um, uh, adjustment or coping or the ability to deal with the situation. Uh, and it may need to be addressed by it separately. Uh, so, in other words, uh, perhaps a review uh, or, or medication or, or something to help the individual uh, reduce the level of uh, uh, anxiety or mood and to get them into a position where they can actually deal with the situation. Now, when we think about health, uh, we understand health as being a combination of factors. So it's not just the biological, i.e. the pathology or the illness, uh, but it's also uh, a combination of the psychological and the social, i.e. health and health behaviour is governed by those three factors. And the next slide, and, and more importantly, the interaction between those three areas. So uh, this slide uh, illustrates some of those factors. So uh, for example, things like swallowing problems, muscle weakness, um, um, medical treatments and their side effects, maybe the physical uh, signs of the illness, but things like changes in identity, social relationships, uh, family planning, or financial emotion, uh, employment consequences are uh, the more su subtle, or, um, less visible aspects of an illness. Um, and they may indeed be hidden um, and not so apparent, uh, but necessary and important to consider when thinking about health. I said, uh, I mentioned stress, and we forget that the health itself is a stress. Uh, or a source of stress. Uh, it's not just uh, the common uh, uh, things that we all think about, for example, uh, work or family or relationships and so on, uh, or finances. Right? Uh, and patients, individuals, often forget that actually managing and coping with the burden of the health condition itself is a form of stress. So when you think about the cardinals, um, think about all the things that you have to keep in mind, all the things that you have to do in order to navigate through the world or through life with this, this condition, right? And that can be considered a form of stress. Uh, it's an additional burden. Right? 
Uh, and it's important to think about where one is on the uh, stress scale and what factors are uh, adding to that. So thinking about I mean, where you are, are you feeling relaxed and coping well? Are you becoming stressed or anxious? And I'll come back to the signs and symptoms of anxiety uh, later on. Or indeed, are you overwhelmed? Um, and these things affect how we then deal with other aspects or other stresses. Um, this uh, slide also gives you a, examples of how an individual might uh, manage those stresses or how they might manage some of those things and alleviate the pressure. For example, things like talking to someone uh, or introducing strategies like time management or practicing mindfulness if you're into those sorts of things. Now, this is not prescriptive. The task here is to work out your own strategies, your own needs, but one can only do that initially by becoming aware of the problem. Right? So mapping out the stresses in your life is a useful uh, tactic, a starting point. Okay, now in terms of coping, how people cope with uh, health events, uh, they tend to, kind of strategies tend to cluster into problem focused and emotion focused. Um, so problem focus where you address or uh, try and eliminate the source of stress, um, whereas emotional ones are more about how you respond to or the res emotional response to the event. In my experience in health uh, and in neuromuscular and uh, the cardinals, uh, I, my view is that uh, patients are very good at problem focus coping strategies. Um, so seeking information, uh, developing practical uh, skills or seeking practical support, and taking part in treatment, becoming involved in uh, trials and, and working with charities. Uh, I think um, uh, our patients are very good at that, right? Um, what's more difficult, more challenging is the emotion focused coping strategies. This, these often get missed. So sharing and being able to express the, uh, uh, the distressing feelings, uh, the anger, the sadness, the shame, and so on. And accessing support, i.e. by talking to others. Uh, it doesn't have to be a psychologist, it can be other people. Um, uh, and it can be other sources, things like people to uh, use religion, for example. Um, and being able to shut things off as well, enough so that you can actually focus on tasks. Right? Um, so this is something that people do find difficult, and, and there's many reasons for it. Um, it can be hard to find people who are able to or willing to kind of listen to some of these different things. So then hence things like support groups uh, and networks can be helpful. So a useful strategy is to think about, well, you know, what, what techniques or what methods do you use for coping and can you um, add to those? Right? Other patterns people fall into are the five flight or freeze response. Um, so fight, meaning I'm not gonna let this thing get on top of me, I'm gonna push through and so on. Uh, or the flight, I'm just gonna get away from it, uh, avoid any, any threats, avoid being in front of people, so on. In Ricardo's it could be avoid uh, anything that uh, leads to contracture. Uh, and the freeze, uh, what's the point? Nothing's gonna help. And each one requires a different type of intervention. Um, and sometimes, you know, as all human beings, uh, you know, over reliance on one particular strategy or one particular approach can lead to problems further down the line and we can end up feeling a bit stuck. So, for example, if the strategy is I'll do things when I feel good um, and I won't do it when I don't feel good, then, you know, we can sometimes find that um, we end up doing less and less and less over time. Uh, and finally, uh, the feeling of burnout, an important one to, uh, to keep in mind. Uh, and as you saw in that stress uh, bucket, if you like the image, you know the signs of when it all feels too much. Uh, and again, an important uh, indicator of then maybe it's time to get uh, extra support, review strategies, or maybe even get professional support. Um, and I should say, uh, it, with you know all of these slides, these are slides for information, right? Um, I think uh, when making changes or doing anything, uh, it's worth thinking about uh, getting uh, professional support or help if it's available. Um, 
uh, for that extra uh, input. Okay, now in terms of McArdle's what specific things that uh, I, I emerge when we work with uh, McArdle patients, but one of the things is, is the role of pain. Um, and I don't think this has been really uh, fully explored uh, in terms of understanding that pain uh, and understanding the psychological responses to it. But there've been a, a couple of studies. Uh, so one is um, by Hazen Brink, uh, who looked at uh, pain responses and the uh, beliefs about pain in a group of McCullough patients, a small group, right? um, but it echoes uh, our kind of observations that pain is a, a prevailing feature in McCullough's and often uh, has an impact on how people then respond or behave to it. Uh, and that individuals can fall into uh, three broad categories of ways of coping. It's again, as I was saying, we, uh, it's important to recognize where one is um, uh, or what strategies one uses. So it's self-awareness about the, the techniques one uses to cope. So uh, Hayes and Brain talk about the uh, the avoidance insurance model of pain. Uh, and uh, despite the errors, it's fairly, I would say, fairly straightforward in many ways. Uh, so the uh, avoidance pattern uh, is could be considered like a, a, a flight response. So any threat, uh, i.e. pain in this case, uh, or any signal of a threat, so pain, uh, the response is to avoid. And uh, it's a good strategy. You shouldn't do things that cause you pain or try and avoid it. However, over-reliance on it can lead to uh, one doing less and less and less because uh, as you avoid more and more uh, uh, triggers or, or uh, uh, situations that cause pain, uh, we know that um, you know uh, you may actually then uh, uh, find that uh, you you're, um, you become deconditioned or um, any sign of pain that leads you doing less and less and less. And so, uh, a pattern, uh, an individual can then put a pattern of uh, having markedly reduced activities. Uh, the other side of that is that, of course. As we do less and less and less in life, uh, life suddenly becomes quite dull as well. You know, we find that our social network, our activities are reduced to the point where actually it feels a bit pointless, hence moved. And that's the relationship between the anxiety and depression, sometimes in some cases. Now, the endurance pattern is the, uh, the fight response. So uh, here, the individual experiences pain and the, their mantra, if you like, is no pain, no gain. You know, just uh, push on through, I'll fight this. Uh, again, good strategy, right? In some situations, um, and in some situations we do have to push. However, over reliance on this uh, app and ignoring the consequences means that individuals may experience contractions, so uh, which could then lead to longer term problems and difficulties, which we all know about within the cartons. But uh, you know, uh, it's the psychological consequences of that is also that it can lead to. Uh, more anxiety, more worry, and also low mood. Um, and individuals can flip between the two. So you know, someone who's going through the, uh, used to the insurance strategy may um, experience a contraction, which then makes them hypervision, hyper anxious about uh, uh, future events and then uh, fall into the avoidance pattern. Um, now, the, the goal um, is to adopt a coping strategy. So where there's a flexibility, and this is the key, flexibility uh, moving between uh, uh, avoidance and endurance. So the task is to know when to push and when to pull back. And here, uh, as I said earlier, here, it may be that what's needed is, is expert opinion, you know, getting advice from your, your physiotherapist and, and your consultants and so on. So knowing what, what is the appropriate time to push and uh, when is the appropriate time to kind of pull back. But when you speak to expert patients, um, uh, people who um, you know have uh, been managing their recardals over a number of years, um, you know, you, you discover that they actually use this uh, intuitively. And uh, uh, I have learned, and that's a key part of the condition, I have learned, uh, to recognize the signals and learn to uh, 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 respond appropriately. 
according to so that flexibility knowing when to push when to pull back that's the real goal right uh, so again an important task recognize where you are you know what's your natural tendency uh, in that on that uh, pattern okay and as i said anxiety is is more prevalent it's the thing that uh, people report um rather than depression okay uh, and compared to other conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, in our small, and it was a small sample, only 23 patients that we looked at, uh, you know, anxiety does seem to be more prevalent. Okay. Uh, but as I say, this, this needs to be um, taken uh, in mind of the data, data collection. So a small sample, uh, self selected, i.e., not. You know, individuals who didn't respond, uh, who may have been missed, and so on. So, uh, you do need to uh, take that with a pinch of, not a pinch of salt, but just be cautious and generalizing. Uh, however, uh, what are those anxieties about? Well, we know it's things like uh, uh, concerns about the changes in physical health, um, worries about the future, uh, concerns about how other people will view. Other things that come up are also things like uh, the role of shame, not being believed in previous health experiences. We know things like the cards in rare conditions, uh, the other GSDs are hard and can be hard to diagnose or to get to the point of diagnosis. And uh, people's experiences with that uh, um, can, uh, can have an impact, right? Um, I'm going to demystify psychology a little bit here. Uh, so what actually goes on, what goes on in the room. Um, so firstly, uh, and the reason I'm demystifying is because you know, when people see a psychologist with them, they'll say the first question, or one of the questions may be, why on earth do I need to see a psychologist? What's that about? You know, do I have to talk about myself? Are you going to talk about my childhood? Da, 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 da. Um, this may be sometimes, but actually, uh, on the whole, uh, our focus is often on the practical living with uh, the health condition, um, uh, recognizing how to help people adapt to uh, uh, to a health condition. So that diagnosis that may be about learning, learning new skills, preparing uh, education. Uh, further down the line, for people who have had the diagnosis from Norway, it may be about retraining uh, and relearning. So recognizing habits, patterns, um, and maybe trying to see whether those can be changed or adapted, or supporting uh, existing behavior. Um, the first thing also uh, is to recognize on strength. So as I said right at the start, uh, people, the threat of health conditions is really not being able to cope, people not being able to cope with this. And it's worth remembering and recognizing that most people have well developed coping strategies. We have all uh, had a situation of adversity in the past uh, and had to cope with it. And there are stories about it, so it may not just be within yourself, but also your family, country, and so on. So it's worth reminding yourself just how adaptable and how resilient we are, right? Um, so it may be worth just checking in and remembering that. So that's the first thing. Second thing, um, health conditions to foster resilience, right? It's worth remembering that when uh, people have grown up with health conditions, they've had to deal with something uh, that's forced. And, and it's, the, the, the approach has often been to, to kind of get on with things and push through uh, and, and have resilience. Right. So you probably have those more than you realize. Uh, an important technique or strategy can be to uh, keep a log. We often forget what we've done, what we've achieved, how far we've come. Uh, and it's really important to try and keep a, a, a note of that or a record of that uh, and, and then progress. Um, it's also important to know, you know uh, where our vulnerabilities are. So um, these are some of the things that um, 
can have an impact or can have an impact on how people cope and manage their health condition. Uh, not all of them apply to everyone, obviously, but it's worth having a think about, well, where are your vulnerabilities? Where might you uh, have difficulty? And again, it may be that you can make very simple changes or just simply being aware of those and knowing that this is a sore spot or this is something that may come up. Uh, or you can think about maybe getting extra support from those. Now, I said uh, there is a, a, a need to think about feelings. I know it's not often something people want to do, but uh, we do have to talk about feelings in psychology. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. So um, it is important to recognize feelings and, uh, and triggers to how we feel and eventually become. So when we talk about things, people, uh, in my experience, most people have a limited uh, vocabulary for feelings. So this is a feeling wheel, if you like, uh, which shows you the full range of at least uh, some of the words that we associate with feelings. Most of us, I think, fall in the middle. I we have a few words, fearful, sad, happy. Furthermore, uh, when we have feelings that are unpleasant, like fearful, we want to do the very thing. We don't want to stay with them. We want to move away from them as quickly as possible. So we try and get to the happy place, if you like. When you see a psychologist, or what this, if you saw me, you know, our task is to actually stay with these feelings and explore them, investigate them. And there's a good reason for that. Uh, if you avoid, you learn nothing. If you stay with the feeling in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a clinic setting, for example, but you can do this on your own, you can do this through diary, writing, and just reflecting, you may be able to expand your vocabulary uh, by thinking about it. So, for example, feeling fearful uh, is that, let's say, feeling fearful, insecure. Um, Try to read this small slide, I can't read it, but fearful, insecure. You may stay with it a bit longer. Uh, and this can be done by thinking about the situations that generate those feelings. Uh, you may then arrive at uh, feeling insecure, inadequate, or feeling insecure, inferior. Now, then you can start thinking about, well, uh, what is it about that situation that makes you feel inadequate? Are there any skills anything that you need to do or can do that will help you feel less inadequate? And thereby we suddenly come to the uh, changes, strategies and so on, right? Uh, so that's the reason we stay with feelings, is to kind of work out and get to what are the underpinning factors to those feelings. Okay. Now, I did mention anxiety is uh, a common feature in the cardinals, or at least we think it is, uh, or more so than depression. So here are some signs and symptoms of anxiety. Uh, and I'm going to flip between this one and the next one, which is depression. So again, symptoms of the signs of depression. Now, what I want you to notice is that there are physical symptoms of depression, right? Unexplained aches and pains, changes in appetite or weight. Um, uh, what other ones are there? Uh, lack of energy, low sex drive, right? Uh, and in anxiety, similarly, um, palpitations, uh, trembling, sweating, stomach aches, uh, tiredness, muscle ache, uh, pins and needle headaches, muscle tension. Um, so it's important to remember that. Um, when we're feeling stressed and anxious, it can manifest itself physically, of course, with things like the neuromuscular condition and the cardinals. Those muscle tensions can also lead to uh, 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 you know, things like contractures and so on. So uh, it's twofold. One is it's important to manage our anxiety and learn to de stress and learn to. Uh, alleviate or reduce the sources of those anxiety and tension. Number two, uh, changes in um, uh, or aches and pains and those sorts of symptoms may not be an indication necessarily that uh, the condition is changing the condition. It may be a sign of uh, uh, stress or other factors. So it's worth spending time thinking about uh, where or what is causing some of those uh, difficulties. Okay, so uh, 
Finally, I'm going to come on to uh, how, how to make changes, another key part of uh, the psychological work. So making change is difficult, it's the first line. Uh, and it's really important to think about uh, being smart with how you set your targets and your goals. Uh, and this is a useful way of uh, thinking about it. So being specific, having a goal, uh, for example, I want to be fit, I want to get fitter or healthier is uh, too vague. Right? Uh, we need to be, uh, when we're setting goals for ourselves, we need to be much more specific. And it has to be clearly measurable and uh, so you know when you hit it, right? Uh, they also have to be achievable and realistic. And this is sometimes where people get stuck, because we all have ideas about where we want to be, but we need to be, they need to be grounded in the reality of where we actually are, where we're starting from. Uh, I would say with these, uh, um, you know, it's useful to speak to your, um, your team, your medical team, or physiotherapists, or psychologists maybe, but physiotherapists, dietitians, and so on, uh, to work, help you uh, work out what those goals are in a way that's achievable uh, and smart. <laughs> okay. Uh, but as I say, change is difficult. We're creatures of habit, uh, and it's sometimes difficult to change those habits. So it's really important to think about uh, change is a cycle of process, it's not something that's going to happen straight away. Um, but we have to work on it. Uh, and there may be um, barriers to it which may only emerge as you make those changes. Okay, I'm going to stop there uh, with the last word uh, from one of my patients who I saw, uh, who was grappling with this idea of um, how to how to uh, enter the world, be in the world, uh, or face of the anxiety about the health condition and what might happen. And he came up with this, he found this somewhere in his reading. Really. Uh, and I think, you know, ultimately, the question about what is the psychological aspect of the need uh, within the cardinals and the neuromuscular conditions in general. It is about, you know, how to live with. A health condition, a neuromuscular condition, and more importantly, um, that despite the past and, and concerns about the future, uh, that there is a life to live. Okay, very finally, uh, some references, uh, some books, materials that uh, my patients have found helpful, uh, particularly the Living with the Enemy, uh, Mind and Progress for Health. Um, some uh, websites as well that can be helpful. Okay, thank you very much.